Monday edition of PFTOT, just four weeks away from the glorious or otherwise return of PFT Live to the weekday lineup on Peacock. Every weekday or thereabouts, I'll be talking to you here. And this is the week that's supposed to be the low watermark as far as NFL news is concerned. The week before the 4th of July, nothing really going on. Well, this year, something's going on. As we found out, not through a Friday afternoon bad news dump, they waited until low tide Saturday night. They mobilized to let it be known to multiple reporters that coming Tuesday, the disciplinary hearing for Browns quarterback Deshaun Watson will commence. Now, we didn't know how this was going to play out. I thought the league would announce what its proposed suspension was as step one of a three-step process. Step two, Judge Sue L. Robinson, retired federal judge, the disciplinary officer hired by the league and the union to preside over these matters, would have a hearing and issue her decision. Step three, as long as there's any discipline imposed, the commissioner has final say over what happens to Deshaun Watson. Step one just got glossed over. Now, it was leaked to Andrew Beaton of the Wall Street Journal an hour or so after it was leaked to multiple other reporters that the hearing starts on Tuesday. Beaton reported that the league is looking for an indefinite suspension of Deshaun Watson to last a minimum of one year. And Beaton pointed out that the league has focused on five of the complaints against Deshaun Watson that have corroboration. Plenty out there. And Browns fans, look, I'm with you. I, I, I understand you've been put in a bad spot by Deshaun Watson and by your favorite team, that you have to circle the wagons, that you have to defend Deshaun Watson. If he was playing for any other team, you wouldn't care. He's playing for your team and you have to defend him. They've put you in this spot. I'm upset on your behalf, even though you're upset with me for pointing it out, for talking about it, for covering the biggest story of the summer and one of the biggest stories in the NFL for the past 15 plus months. You shouldn't be in this position. The Browns shouldn't have traded for him or they should have done what the Dolphins tried to do last year. We're only going to trade for you if you settle all of the cases. And I think if all the cases would have been gone, before Deshaun Watson arrives, yes, you still have to worry about a suspension, but it's got a different vibe to it. You don't have to get into the nooks and crannies and the nitty gritty of where's the evidence. That's one of the arguments we hear all the time. Where's the evidence? Well, testimony of the individuals who believe their rights were violated by Deshaun Watson is evidence. And also, again, five cases. The NFL believes corroboration comes from text messages and other things that occurred to show that this isn't just some after the fact money grab. Oh, we're suing Deshaun Watson. Oh, we're getting free money. Oh, sign me up too. That's what makes those cases more compelling when you can show that there was something extemporaneous to the event that caused people to document in some way, whatever it is that they believe happened to them. So the NFL, as expected, making a big push for significant discipline of Deshaun Watson. The next question becomes how long this hearing will last and how it will unfold from an evidence standpoint and from the perspective of the defenses that the NFL Players Association will be permitted to make on behalf of Deshaun Watson. And this is going to be the truest test of whether or not Judge Robinson is actually independent. Now, the reality is, and as I posted at PFT, she's really not independent because once she serves two years under the CBA, either side can fire her with four months notice. So if she does anything, either in the decision she renders or the way she conducts this process that the league or the union don't like, if they really don't like it, they can fire her. So she's really not independent. And I say that because the NFLPA is going to push aggressively what I think is the strongest defense on behalf of Deshaun Watson. It's not rooted in whether or not he did anything wrong. It's based on the argument that the personal conduct policy by its terms says that owners are held to a higher standard. And as we've reported and as others have confirmed, the NFLPA is going to focus on Dan Snyder, the owner of the commanders, Robert Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, and Jerry Jones, the owner of the Cowboys. Whether and to what extent they were investigated or disciplined for potential personal conduct policy violations of their own. 
So how do you begin to make that comparison? Because the argument will be that anything you do to Deshaun Watson has to be in fair proportion to what you did to them. Well, you don't just wave a magic wand and say it's proportional. You have to know what they did. Judge Robinson has to examine what they did. What did the league conclude? What did the league do to investigate? What did the league do to decide whether or not there will be discipline? What text messages or emails or other conversations may have occurred on the question of whether or not we're even going to look into it? These are important considerations to truly make a fair comparison between Deshaun Watson and those three owners. Some evidence is going to be needed. Some documents will need to be gathered and reviewed. And if Judge Robinson goes that way, if Judge Robinson tells the shield that it's going to have to open up the documents, the files, the evidence, and share with the NFLPA things that it has tried desperately, especially as it relates to the commanders, to keep hidden. That's not going to go over well at 345 Park Avenue. That could make Judge Robinson a one-and-done disciplinary officer, supposedly independent under the collective bargaining agreement for the purposes of personal conduct policy. So that to me is going to be the truest test. And it'll unfold this week. Jeffrey Kessler, who will be representing the NFLPA and Deshaun Watson in this matter, he will aggressively argue, aggressively argue in favor of finding out what was decided, what was discussed, what was debated, what was done to Snyder, Kraft, and Jones. And if Judge Robinson lets him get the information he'll need to make that argument, the NFLPA will, not the NFLPA, excuse me, the NFL will be pissed. So that to me is going to be the truest indication of whether or not Judge Robinson wants to keep this job or whether or not she's willing to stick her finger in the eye of the NFL and let the consequences fall where they may. Then, after she issues her decision, whatever it may be, as long as any discipline is imposed on Deshaun Watson, that's when the commissioner's on the scene. Either side can appeal, and he can impose whatever discipline he wants. He can do exactly what the league has proposed. And look, the league is him. He is the person who is ultimately responsible for the folks who have proposed an indefinite suspension of at least one year. So why wouldn't he reach the same decision? Why wouldn't he? Is there going to be something that comes out in this hearing that causes him to take a step back and reflect on the wisdom of the decision that they made before the hearing even started? Are you kidding me? That's why when this procedure first came to light in 2020, now they tried to sell it as oh, a true independence under the personal conduct policy. Once I read the fine print, like, no, it's a show. It's a sham. It's a whitewash. Ultimately, the commissioner is going to do whatever the commissioner wants to do unless Judge Robinson decides no discipline at all for Deshaun Watson. And I can guarantee you this. I can't guarantee you many things. I guarantee you this. If she decides no discipline for Deshaun Watson, it's going to be no disciplinary officer for Judge Robinson moving forward because the NFL probably the next day will exercise its prerogative to terminate her position on 120 days notice. So this will play out, look, over the next month. Who knows? It depends upon how much evidence is going to be permitted by Judge Robinson under the defense that the punishment has to be proportional to other owners. So it could take a week, it could take a month, it could take longer. And then the commissioner has to handle the appeal. They'd like to get this done before the start of training camp. And there was a report not long ago where the league bemoaned the fact that the NFLPA may bog this down. Hey, the NFLPA has got the right. The NFLPA has the obligation to defend Deshaun Watson. Don't, don't rush them. My dad used to call it the Rush Act. Don't give them the Rush Act. Let them make their decision. Let them take their time. Let them make their defense. The NFL is the one that's dragged its feet for 15 months. Now it's all of a sudden got to be done. Got to get it done. Got to go, go, go. No. The NFLPA should have every right to articulate and present a very clear, full-throated defense on behalf of Deshaun Watson. And it is odd that it all broke on Saturday night. Best I can tell... On Friday night or Saturday morning or sometime around then, both sides were said, get your ducks in a row, get your act together, we're going on Tuesday. I mean, that really was a surprise. It's just out of the blue, boom, here it goes. Hearing is on Tuesday. 
Somebody was talking to Judge Robinson to get it all set up. Now, it's possible both sides chose to keep it quiet because it really did help everyone to bury it on Saturday night. Is it going to be as big of a deal today and tomorrow as it would have been if it had been announced Monday morning that the hearing starts on Tuesday? There'll be other things for the sports radio shows to talk about. It does fade. It doesn't have the same oomph as if it lands on a Monday. That's why they drop bad news on Fridays. And now Saturday nights at 6 p.m. in late June when no one is paying attention. So maybe both the league and the union wanted it. Either way, everyone is going to be paying attention this week, the week that historically is the week where no one pays attention to the National Football League. Every reason to pay attention this week. And we'll be doing so in real time at profootballtalk.com and most days this week here on PFT OT. We're also paying close attention to what the NFL will say, if anything, about Friday's landmark ruling that removed a constitutional right for all Americans, female or male. Because even though it directly involves the bodies and the choices made from a healthcare perspective by women, there are men involved in these conversations. It affects everyone. It takes away what had been for 50 years a right to seek an abortion under certain terms. There are limitations, there are restrictions, there were balances that were permitted. The right as a matter of constitutional law to an abortion is now gone. It's going to be determined state by state. And look, I got 12 years of Catholic school on my resume. And in high school, we were constantly hammered with a very strong anti-abortion message. Personally, and, and I, I, uh, I understand it is not a black and white issue. I mean, generally speaking, I would prefer that it not be used as a matter of convenience or luxury, that it be something that is done only out of necessity, incest, rape, health of the mother, health of the fetus. Those things need to be, I think, considered. There are nuances to this. Too many people try to make it absolute. It's not absolute. There are too many circumstances that either relate to the way the pregnancy happened or relate to the manner in which the pregnancy unfolds. And it's a 50 year constitutional right. What we're hearing now, the talking point is, it's not mentioned in the constitution. Well, there's plenty of things not mentioned in the constitution. And also, you know, this is something that was a court opinion. It can be overturned. Well, it's not supposed to be. You're supposed to respect the precedents of yesteryear. And we've heard every time a Supreme Court justice is up for a confirmation hearing, we've heard them say that they respect the precedent. The concept is called stare decisis, binding law. The precedents of the Supreme Court are supposed to stand and only under the rarest of circumstances do they get scrapped. And this one got scrapped in one fell swoop. Now, I mention all this because the NFL has spent the last 15, 20 years, maybe longer, pandering to female fans. Hey, why just have men watch football? We can double our fan base if we can get women interested in football. Remember those years? And they gravitated away from it. But the, the breast cancer awareness in October, the pink that was everywhere. You still see some highlights of the years where pink was everywhere on the game uniform. Big push by the NFL to expand the female fan base. I hate to be cynical about it, but it's truth. And now you've got workplace environments where females have been the subject of misconduct. We know what happened with the commanders. Well, we don't really know because they'll not, they won't let us know, but we know something bad happened. Now the Raiders are having issues that need to be fully investigated and explored and, of course, swept under the rug once the NFL finds out what happened. We've got six attorneys general who have put the league on notice. You better treat your women and your minorities better or you're going to have potential criminal prosecutions. How can you say that you truly support those individuals if you are silent? Silent in response to what happened on Friday. The NBA, not silent. What about those female employees that works for teams in states where immediately, instantly, the right to abortion under any circumstance is gone? It's criminalized. 10 years, 20 years, life in prison. What do you say to them? We've seen other companies say, we'll, we'll pay for your expenses to go to a state where you still have that right. So... 
I'm not surprised the NFL didn't say anything. Look, it reminds me of what happened in the context of the anthem controversy. The NFL had two extremes. The NFL chose to cater to one specific group that it feared more than the other group. The NFL feared the group that hated the idea of anyone peacefully protesting during the national anthem instead of the group that supported it because the NFL thought the group that opposed it could do more harm to the bottom line. It's that simple. Again, I hate to be cynical, but that's what businesses do. They're worried about the bottom line. The NFL is worried about its bottom line. The NFL expanded its bottom line by pandering to women for years. And now the NFL is saying, whoa, 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 let's just keep our heads low and our mouths shut. Because if we say anything about this, that same group that came after us over the anthem is going to come after us over this. And part of the problem is, and I don't want to make this a political conversation, but politics can become life and life can become politics. On, on certain moments like this, it all, it all kind of comes together, right? And it affects people's lives, literally. So it needs to be discussed. The NFL needs to have a position on it. Somebody said, why does the NFL have to have a position on everything? It doesn't. Some things, though, require the NFL to say something, especially if the NFL is, as it claims to be, so interested and respectful of the rights of women. You have to say something about this. And, and look, this is difficult for me. But, and it's difficult because of my Catholic upbringing and everything I heard for 12 years of school. You can imagine, 12 years of Catholic school, you can imagine the things I heard over the years about abortion. But I understand the fact, and I respect the fact, that not everyone who lives in this country practices a religion or believes in God. That's one of our rights. That's one of our fundamental rights as Americans. So why should religion be driving this bus? Why should the default position be, well, it's against the Bible? Well, there's plenty of people out there that have no regard for what's in the Bible. They don't believe it. They're allowed to not believe it. People first sailed across the Atlantic Ocean to escape religious persecution so they could practice religion the way they want. This country is supposed to be about not practicing a religion at all if you don't want to. So why do these religious concepts drive what becomes law and policy and constitutional right or not? Anyway, I know I'm getting off track, but you're listening. You're still listening. You haven't thrown a shoe at your computer yet, hopefully. The point is, these are real issues. And at some point, the NFL needs to say something about it. The NBA has the NFL hasn't. I specifically asked them on Sunday, do you have any comment, any statement, anything at all? And they didn't respond. Usually what happens is they wait for me to ask again, and then they don't respond. And then I ask again, and then they either say no comment or they respond or whatever. Well, this time it's like, I'm not playing that game anymore. I'm done playing that game, NFL. You're on fair notice. I know you monitor everything we say and do. I'm not going to ask you three times anymore. I'm going to ask you once. If you can't give me the courtesy of a response once, I'm going to assume you don't want to say anything, and I'm going to say the NFL didn't respond. I'm not going to give you two or three chances. You get one from now on. I'm done. I'm done with that game. It's over. It ends today. So the NFL had nothing to say when asked a specific question. Mike Silver, who worked for the NFL for a decade or so, called them out. Called them out. We'll see how it goes. Again, it's not easy for me. I know it pisses people off, but we have to embrace these issues because they do affect life. They will affect the lives of millions of Americans, one way or the other. And to treat this as a clear, bright line, no-brainer position doesn't work that way. Too many subtleties, too many nuances, too many situations where the pregnancy happened under circumstances that would justify termination of it or things have happened during the course of the pregnancy that make termination necessary to the ongoing viability of the mother. And that's just gone now. And, and I didn't even get to Clarence Thomas's invitation to start taking up any other rights that have already been established that affect other Americans, cultural rights, whether it's gay rights or contraceptive rights, they're all going to be under assault as the democracy morphs into a theocracy and as we become two countries residing within one set of borders. I've given a lot of thought to how this plays out. 
and I don't want to think about it anymore because I don't like how it potentially ends. Um, I mentioned the national anthem controversy earlier, and we, we had an appearance. And, and, and I think what's going on here, here's my opinion. Warren Sapp has emerged after five, six, seven years of being out of the spotlight. His career at NFL media ultimately ended because of his own misconduct away from the camera and microphone. He started to emerge again, and I think he is contemplating carving out some real estate in the very profitable, right-leaning sports media space, because there are so many people who are sports fans who are right-leaning. And from that position of espousing the various right-leaning views, will scream at anyone who dares to suggest anything that could be left-leaning and tell them to stick to sports while they continue to espouse the right-leaning views and profit from it. I think Warren Sapp thinks there may be a lane for him there. He, he said some things recently that defended John Gruden for the comments that were made in the emails that ultimately got John Gruden fired. And more recently, Warren Sapp addressing Colin Kaepernick's workout with the Raiders saying, I heard it was terrible. I heard it was one of the worst workouts ever. I mean, that is such a hyperbolic statement. How do you even prove that? One of the worst workouts ever. How do you even begin to prove that? A hundred years of NFL life and Colin Kaepernick's workout was one of the worst ever. Anytime you hear that kind of hyperbole, that's when you have to have your BS detector start to flash. What's he really trying to do here? Who's he really trying to pander to? What's he really trying to set himself up for? in the media space. I asked Kaepernick's agent about Sapp's comments. Kaepernick's agent responded forcefully. The post is at PFT. Hundreds of thousands have already visited the post. I'm sure people will watch this video and it will polarize folks. But you know, the bottom line is, we know why Colin Kaepernick was shunned by the NFL and continues to be shunned. Now at this point, after five years out, maybe his skills have eroded. I don't know. But all the indications contemporaneous to the workout were that it was a good workout. And as Peter King explained on PFT Live, maybe now Kaepernick is on what they call the ready list for the Raiders. If they need a backup quarterback, they'll call him. Maybe some other team will bring him in for a workout as we get closer to camp. Who knows? Who knows? But the idea that you're just going to say it was one of the worst workouts ever with nothing to back it up other than I heard, I heard. Who's talking to Warren Sapp? How does Warren Sapp know? And when Ka and I know Kaepernick's agent has a bias in this, but he says, I've talked to the GM. I've talked to the head coach. They thought it was a good workout. Now, if he's lying, the coach and the GM can make their views known that Jeff Nally is misrepresenting what was said to him about Kaepernick's workout. And I know that it's, it's a minefield, but I, I just, I ignored what Sapp originally said because I think I know which way his, his resurrected for him, hopefully, media career is heading. And uh, I have a feeling it's heading down a path where we're going to be hearing plenty of things from Warren Sapp that would be music to the ears of those who would like to tell the rest of us to stick to sports. All right, let's see if there's any questions today before we wrap this up. PFT PM Posse, in Playmakers, you mentioned how Rams quarterback Case Keenum wasn't checked for a concussion and nobody got punished because there were so many people who screwed up. Is that the loophole for teams splitting the responsibilities because with multiple people, uh, nobody's fully responsible? And yeah, that, that's the point that we make in Playmakers, and I argued it at the time. There are so many people with their finger on the button to, sh to shut down the game and check someone for a concussion that, that everyone with the finger on the button is deferring to someone else. And nobody wants to be the one to press the button and stop a game, especially in crunch time, games on the line. We're going to take out the quarterback of one of the teams when if you take him out and you put in his backup, all of a sudden, all hope is lost. We've seen that in big games, whether it was the Panthers Broncos week one, 2016, when Cam Newton was being bruised and battered and nobody said maybe he should come out and get checked as they're driving down the field for a potential game-winning field goal. I think the field goal was missed and the Broncos won that game. Whether it's playoff game and Julian Edelman, remember in the Super Bowl, Julian Edelman got his bell rung, never got taken out to be checked. It's happened before. And 
Fortunately for the NFL, there hasn't been a worst case scenario with someone who has a concussion, was left in a game and got another concussion and had some serious health consequence. That's the risk. But the other side of that coin for the NFL, and coin is always the operative word, you don't want to take out a key player in a key moment of a key game and have that affect the outcome of the game. If a quarterback or some other important player isn't available, and it's not easy, it's not easy. The NFL is lucky that there haven't been many major controversies on that point in recent years. And one of the reasons is they're doing everything they can to minimize the situations where somebody would even potentially have a head injury. It's still unavoidable to a certain extent, but as they carve away the different circumstances where a head injury can happen, they make certain techniques illegal. It does, as a practical matter, reduce the total number of situations where somebody could get a concussion during games. And they're trying to reduce the number of concussions during games because they understand it can be, if unaddressed, an existential threat to the entire operation. PFT PM Posse, again, how can the NFL, or any rich and powerful people for that matter, push any case they want to the Supreme Court? Shouldn't it be used more for things affecting more slash most Americans? Let's pretend it's a legitimate Supreme Court for this exercise and not the current Supreme Court. Yeah, here's what the NFL does. And this has come up as it relates to the NFL's obsession with arbitration, the secret rigged kangaroo court of Roger Goodell that they try to push every controversy into. They did it with the St. Louis relocation case pushed it through the Missouri courts. And then when they didn't get the ruling they wanted there, they filed what they call a petition for writ of certiorari to the US Supreme Court. And whether you exhaust all your appeals in a state or you exhaust your appeals in the federal system, the last ditch effort is to ask the Supreme Court to take up the case. And there are literally thousands of petitions every year that go to the Supreme Court. Everyone's got the right to do that. It's not a matter of the rich and the powerful. Everyone's got the right to ask the Supreme Court to take up the case. And the Supreme Court only takes up a handful of cases every year. And I don't want to get into the details as to why the Supreme Court makes the decisions that it makes. But the bottom line is you have the right to take it up. You have the right to try to convince the Supreme Court to agree to hear your case. Now, sometimes what is good news on the front end, hey, the Supreme Court's taken my case, becomes bad news. The Supreme Court has taken the case to rule against you. But you, you, you lose if they don't take up the case anyway. So at a minimum, you delay the eventual defeat if they take up your case and you have a chance of winning. But it's, it's not some nefarious thing that is reserved only to the rich and powerful. Anyone can do it. It's not all that expensive. And uh, it's usually something that, that fails because the Supreme Court, again, only takes up a few cases a year. PFTPM Posse, boy, all sorts of different topics today from uh, the PFTPM Posse account. How would TB12 owning a piece of a team, i.e. the Dolphins, or a promise to be offered a piece of the team upon retirement be treated with regards to the salary cap? Well, there was an issue with John Elway years ago under the salary cap, and Pat Boland wanted to give him a piece of the team, and, and something blew up there. And I saw, I saw someone do the math that if it had gone through, Elway would have made hundreds of millions of dollars as part of the sale of the Broncos. Now, the salary cap is a factor, but there are ways around it and you have to work your way around it. And it would have gotten strange and awkward if Tom Brady had bought a piece of the Dolphins and then became the quarterback of the Dolphins. But, but really, if you sell it for fair value, if you say it's, it's like, hey, we're gonna, I'm going to give you 10 percent of the team for ten dollars, that would be a sign that something is amiss. If it is consistent with the value of the team, then you don't get into a salary cap issue. But uh, it's definitely a potential minefield for any team that would try to do something like that. And it's one of the reasons why it rarely, if ever, gets done. Tom Marshall, otherwise known as A Red Zona UK, is it inevitable that any suspension for Deshaun Watson will be reduced on appeal? Now, I don't think it's inevitable. I think, if anything, it's inevitable that it would be increased on appeal. Because I think the NFL comes in minimum one year with an indefinite suspension aimed at protecting the NFL in the event there are more cases filed against Deshaun Watson in the future. Judge Sue L. Robinson reduces it. And then Commissioner Goodell says, no, not good enough. We're, we're going we're gonna to increase it back to what we originally wanted. So I don't think it's inevitable it's reduced. I think if anything, it's inevitable it's increased. Uh, but there's, I, even then, who knows? This is all new territory. 
The NFL hasn't implemented this procedure before. It was adopted two years ago. We'll see how it plays out. But I would not say it's inevitable that it's going to be reduced on appeal. If anything, I would think it would be increased on appeal. Robbie NYC, given the events last week in Supreme Court land and the NFL official lack of a statement, do you agree that the NFL PA pales by comparison to the NBA PA? And is that the main reason? Well, the NBA and the NFL are two different leagues, obviously, and the unions are different. And right now, the NFL PA basically has a leadership vacuum because DeMora Smith, who still doesn't have a contract for his final term, is in the process of being replaced once they find the next NFL PA executive director. And it was reported last week by Ben Fisher of Sports Business Journal that the executive committee of the NFL PA has hired a search firm to help them identify candidates. See, that, that's the challenge. The executive committee is made up of, of a bunch of players who now have to figure out who's our next executive director going to be. We need some help here. This isn't something you do every day. It hasn't happened since 2009 when they hired D. Smith. So I think right now it's a, it's a difficult time to expect the NFLPA to do much of anything because they are in a period of transition that has lasted since last October and who, much, who knows how much longer it will last. But it's a great point because it's not like the union has come out and said anything regarding Friday's decision. Uh, and uh, maybe the NFL won't say anything unless and until the union pushes it to do so. Sean Alvashire. The Saints were criticized for being over aggressive in the 2022 draft, but based on your reporting on the Cowboys and Dolphins deals for Peyton, could it be that Mickey Loomis has an idea of the hall of picks he is going to get for Peyton in 2023? I, are you replenishing a first round pick next year? I mean, the way I hear it, Dolphins are ready to give up the first round pick for Sean Payton. Now, after he's out for a year, does, does the value begin to drop? Depends on how many teams want Sean Payton. There could be multiple teams jockeying to get Sean Payton next year. And the reality is, even though the formal process plays out a certain way, it all kind of gets worked out behind the scenes before you even initiate the launch sequence. Because the way it works is new team contacts old team and says, we'd like to negotiate with your coach who's under contract with you. Old team and new team work out compensation that would change hands if new team hires the coach. Then once that compensation is worked out, new team has the green light to go talk to the coach. And this isn't a situation where coach is just sitting there minding his own business. And all of a sudden he gets a knock on the door. Some new team wants to hire. And he's like, oh, that's a shock to me. Everybody kind of knows what's going on before it happens. So look, they were aggressive this year to trade up in the draft. And I think they feel pretty good about their team this year. And yeah, maybe the fact that they know that they're going to get some value for Sean Payton next year, made them more willing to kind of go all in with what they have. The Saints are kind of in an unprecedented spot. Can you think of a time where a team's head coach leaves? A head coach who had become so synonymous with the organization and so widely viewed as responsible, along with Drew Brees, for its success. He leaves, pretty much everyone else stays. And now we see how it goes. No new coach brought in. No new personality to change things around. You know, I think of the Buccaneers in 2002, Tony Dungy out, John Gruden in. This would be kind of like Tony Dungy out and Monty Kiffin becoming the head coach of the team of the 2002 Buccaneers. This is Dennis Allen stepping in as the head coach. And we saw him do it last year and shut out the Buccaneers in prime time. So uh, it, it's, a, it's an intriguing experiment that I can't remember ever happening in the NFL. And, and I think the Saints, by virtue of the fact that they gave up draft capital to move up in the draft this year, that they believe they may be onto something. When you look at the NFC, who's to say that they don't have a chance to be highly competitive with the Buccaneers, who they have swept two straight years in the regular season or other teams in the NFC? Where are the great teams in the NFC? We assume the Rams are going to be great. Maybe they will be but let's not assume the Saints are going to be horrible just because Peyton's gone. It's going to be an interesting analysis. And I look forward to the day when Sean Payton coaching some new team crosses paths with the Saints because it's coming. I'm not sure about many things, but the day is coming when Sean Payton will be coaching a team against New Orleans Saints.
Tacos and gin. NFL says it will push for a lengthy, unprecedented suspension for Watson. How long is that? They have done year suspensions before, maybe two years. Well, it's been reported, and I have no reason to doubt it, that the NFL is looking for indefinite, at least a year. The NFL is concerned about other cases being filed that would change the analysis. And I think the NFL is concerned about its ability to go back and punish Deshaun Watson again later. So let's just do it all now, indefinite. And then by the middle of next March, we should know, because by then the statutes of limitations will have expired. Assuming he stopped with the social media private massages when he was sued the first time, assuming that that was the end of it, and there's no one after mid-March of 2021 who's going to come forward and say, hey, he's still doing it, folks. He did it again. By the middle of next March, we should know the full universe of claims against Deshaun Watts. And so maybe it'll be a year, maybe it'll be longer. That's all to be determined in the coming days, weeks, and hopefully not months. Hopefully it's just days and weeks. Let's see what else we have here. Da -da. Burn unit. Burn unit. Where are you at here? Uh, when it was reported that Jimmy G is hoping for a quick resolution once he can throw, is he indicating that trade talks are happening and coming to fruition? Uh, or is this supposed to be pressure on the Niners? Look, this is one of the more intriguing dynamics as we get closer to camp. It was reported over the weekend that Jimmy G will be cleared to throw soon. We expected that. Once he's cleared to throw, then maybe he gets traded. The 49ers created the impression they had a trade ready to go. And then the surgery happened and it was over. And, and at times I wonder, do they know something we don't know? Is there a team out there that's just secretly waiting for Jimmy G to be cleared and then they're going to trade for him? Like the, like the Texans. Are the Texans ready to trade for him? They're behind Davis Mills, Davis Mills, Davis Mills, Davis Mills, and then whoop, we'll go get Jimmy G once he's cleared. That could happen. You still have to deal with his contract, $25 million for this year, with no contract beyond 2022. Uh, Jimmy G's got a lot of power here. Because if, if someone's going to trade for him, they're going to want to do something about his contract. Extend it, reduce it. They're going to want to do something. All he has to say is no. And at some point, he gets cut. And then the dance gets awkward. If the 49ers don't trade him and camp opens and he shows up and he says, hey, I'm here, your injury prone quarterback is reporting for duty and maybe he's going to get injured again and you're going to have to pay him $25 million in 2022. That's possible. Could get ugly, could get awkward. And I know the 49ers like to hide behind that, that notion that Jimmy's a nice guy. Jimmy's not going to upset the apple cart. Well, it's about time for Jimmy to upset the apple cart. And we'll see if he does, if he's not traded or released before the start of training camp. Worst case scenario for him, you get to the end of the preseason. He's perfectly healthy. The 49ers go to him and say, we'll keep you. We're only, we're only going to pay you $10 million this year. And if you don't like it, you get cut. He gets cut. Where's he going to go? Unless there's some fluke Teddy Bridgewater injury. And, and those happen very rarely. Quarterbacks are largely off limits during the preseason and training camp. They don't play very much. The starters don't during the preseason. So it, it's, you know, that one falls behind Baker Mayfield on the scale of awkward quarterback situations, it could get very awkward. And we've seen some indications that suggest Jimmy G is not going to play along. We'll see what happens if and when camp opens and he hasn't been traded or released. Let's see. One more question real quick, because I want to make sure everybody understands this. This is from Lewis United. Does the NFLPA have a responsibility to fight for Deshaun Watson when it comes to his suspension? Are they obliged to take his side in this? How does that whole situation work? This is very simple. The NFL Players Association has a duty under federal law to defend Deshaun Watson without question, an absolute duty. It's called a duty of fair representation. It's part of membership in the union. When the employer comes after you and tries to discipline you, the union, you pay your dues, you're a member of the union, has an absolute right to defend you. It becomes problematic when, for example, Richie Incognito, Jonathan Martin, you've got one union member who's the victim, another union member who's the aggressor, gets a little awkward. Not awkward in this situation. There's no one involved in any of this that is also represented by the NFLPA. So yes, the union will fight aggressively. And as I mentioned earlier, Jeffrey Kessler is on the case. He has been a thorn in the side of the league for years. And he will push a very aggressive argument, as mentioned earlier, about the idea that Deshaun Watson's punishment must be proportional to three owners who either weren't punished at all 
or were only mildly punished under the personal conduct policy, where that issue goes may have a long way toward determining what happens to Deshaun Watson. Again, we'll be tracking it every day this week and beyond and everything else that's happening in the NFL. Slowest week of the year, my butt. It's going to be a busy week in the NFL, and we'll be here with you every step of the way. Thanks for some of your time. We'll talk again tomorrow. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.